Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. So this is your lesson on spouses, common law partners, and conjugal partners. So this is a huge topic that plays a big role on your upcoming ICCRC full skills exam. So it's our absolute pleasure to have this lesson with you because it's really an important step in helping you pass the full skills exam. So I really appreciate the time that you're spending in going through these lessons. Be sure to work your way through all the links below here. So we have all the government links waiting for you. We have all these court cases that are really good for you as well because it'll help you take the academic side of this. And you can see it in the context of real life scenarios. And of course, what we do at Full Skills Exam Prep is take all of your academic knowledge of immigration law and transform it to help you see it in the context of your upcoming ICCRC Full Skills Exam. So this is going to be a pretty big lesson with tons and tons and tons of information for you. Now what we like to do in these lesson series is work our way through everything really step by step. So at the beginning of the family class we talked about parents and grandparents and some of those big themes in there. Now with spouses we're going to talk about a few other themes that touch upon a lot of the other programs in family reunification because they relate to pretty much everything. So if you have a good understanding of a lot of those general themes, it'll help you in being able to answer specific little questions in hopefully all of the areas of family immigration. So in order to really master these, of course, you're taking a big step right now by going through the video, going through all these lessons here. Now, a big one, of course, is for you to really work your way through those links on the IRCC website. Now, personally, I really like the guides that they have on the IRCC website. All these links, of course, are below and in order for you. So you can work your way through them. The guides, so guide 3900, which deals with sponsoring a spouse, common law partner, conjugal partner, or dependent child living outside Canada, is a really great one to work through. So it focuses more really on, it's made for clients really, so people who are going to immigrate so that they can read through it themselves. And it's really straightforward really in, I would say, layman's terms. So it's made in language that's really for everybody, even though for a lot of you, of course, you've been specializing in immigration language, immigration documents, manuals, etc. But it's a good general overview for you. Same thing with the next link, which is M5289. So again, very customer service oriented, very straightforward to read through. And personally, I like the way that it's all grouped up as well. All right, you have other really great links to work through as well. So information, determining the eligibility. So this is for the person to see if he or she is actually eligible to be sponsored. Remember though, everything that we're looking at is based on the regulations and the articles. So family class is a pretty big topic on your exam. Uh, we talked about this during the seminar, the breakdown of the topics and what you should be preparing for in terms of the amount of questions in each area. And as you know, family class plays a pretty big role in your exam. So understanding these regulations over here on the bottom, especially regulation 117, is pretty essential for you to pass your exam. So really work your way through those and it'll help you, of course, in seeing everything in the context of how it's going to relate to your exam. So the questions that we're going to deal with later on will really help you to take all this general information and transform it into knowledge that's going to help you in passing your full skills exam, of course, because we're going to look at it through scenarios. And here are some other links for you to work through. So you can see a couple more uh, links that are on the IRCC website, but a couple really good ones here are the manuals. So there aren't that many topics that have manuals anymore. Uh, if you take a look through these manuals as well, you'll see that they're relatively up to date. They're either 2015 or 2016. So that is really rare these days to have manuals, well, manuals on the website in general, but also manuals that are updated. So you should consider yourselves pretty, pretty lucky that you have the opportunity to read through those. They're pretty big, but the beauty of IP8, 
IP2, OP2, is that they're really, really, really well-rounded. So when you work through them, they're about, I would say probably 60 to 80 pages each. But when you work through those, again, it helps you to really reinforce yourself in elements that can pop up in the exam across all of family class. All right, and some of those bulletins. So bulletins are, of course, almost like news releases for you that deal with updates in procedures and things like that that have to do with, in this case, sponsoring spouses, common law partners, conjugal partners, and dependent children. Now, the first step for us in order to be able to really analyze this area as it relates to your exam is to take a look at eligible relationships for sponsoring someone as a spouse, common law partner, or conjugal partner. Now, as a first step, so as a really general base, remember that people can sponsor other people as common law partners, as spouses, or as conjugal partners. It's absolutely essential for you to understand the differences between all three of these. And that's what we're gonna go through in the next few slides here. Okay, so let's take a look at spouses first. Now we're gonna take a look at this in terms of what a person needs to prove in order to sponsor a spouse. Once we get to restricted relationships later on, that'll help you to really dig in to who can be sponsored as a spouse and who can't be sponsored as a spouse. But we'll do a little tiny general overview of this topic to begin the lesson here. So of course with spouses, you have all types. You can see even in the picture here, you have a man marrying a woman, a man marrying a man, and a woman marrying a woman, and transgender, everything like that, right? So here in Canada, of course, same-sex relationships are perfectly fine, perfectly legal, and same-sex couples have the same rights as just about everybody else. But in terms of immigration, it is slightly different. So IP8 has a good example of this for you. Now, in terms of sponsoring a same-sex partner, just like every other relationship, the sponsor has to either be a Canadian permanent resident or a Canadian citizen. And just as, again, a very general uh, need that they would have to prove to the government is that they have to prove that they're married here in Canada. Now, if you're married here in Canada, you receive, of course, a marriage certificate from a province or a territory. If the couple was married in a different country, then they have to prove that that marriage is legal in the other country and also legal here in Canada. Now, the difference, of course, here with same-sex couples is that you'll have to take a look to see if that marriage is legal in the other country. However, if the couple, if the same-sex couple is married here in Canada, then it's not an issue at all. So it's one thing to prove that a couple is married or to say a couple is married in terms of your full skills exam, of course, and in terms of real life too, because you're going to have a lot of clients who sponsor, who, who want to sponsor their spouses. You have to think of the proof that's used in this. So for marriage, it's really straightforward. They have to prove a marriage certificate and photos of the wedding ceremony. So that's if the wedding, of course, is here in Canada. And you might think that that isn't that much proof, but remember, of course, there are undertakings and things like that uh, to really force people to be honest with this, of course. Now, if the marriage is in another country, then they would have to prove, of course, the marriage certificate, wedding ceremony itself as well. And of course, that the marriage is legal in that other country as well. So this is the very general proof used. We're going to dig into this topic a lot more 
as we carry on in this lesson. Now, common law partners is a really interesting topic in this exam, and we're going to dig into this a little bit here, and we'll dig into it more as the lesson goes on. So let's take a look now at the general requirements of sponsoring someone as a common law partner. Now, this is, of course, really important to understand on the whole, and in order to be able to compare a common law relationship to a spouse, to a conjugal partner. So it's really important to understand the difference between all three of those and understanding what a common law relationship is will really help us, of course, in being able to differentiate those three areas that a person can sponsor somebody under. Now you're going to see this quite a bit once you work through the manuals and your regulations, and that is that the relationship has to be a marriage-like relationship. And you're going to see this number here come up quite a bit as well. So they're going to say 12 months, that the couple has to have lived together for 12 months. Uh, we're going to see later on that that is not as easy as it seems. And you're going to have a couple of questions later on that you're going to work through where this type of thing is going to play a role in helping you choose the correct answer. So anyways, as a first step though, a marriage-like relationship where they've been living together for at least 12 months. I've got a little tip for you here, and you're gonna see this quite a bit actually when you start working as an RCIC. So you wanna think of a common law relationship as the same thing as a marriage. It's just that the couple aren't married. So when you think of a marriage and a marriage-like relationship where a couple lives together splits bills, maybe has joint bank accounts, and that type of thing. The common law relationship has to have those elements as well in order for a person to be able to sponsor someone as a common law partner. Uh, another tip for you is that some people seem to get this a little bit confused with sponsoring a boyfriend or a girlfriend or someone they're dating. Uh, it's not like that at all. You're gonna see this when you start working as well. Uh, that you're going to have lots of people who maybe they're dating someone from another country or something like that. Uh, it's not a boyfriend sponsorship or a girlfriend sponsorship. A common law sponsorship is, like I said before, the same thing as marriage. It's just there's no wedding ceremony. Okay, and if you work through the IRCC website as well, you can see that we're going to dig into this a little bit further now. So the couple has to, have, at a minimum, the couple has been living together for a year. And that doesn't mean someone living together, but then they go on a holiday to other countries uh, separately for long periods of time. However, if, of course, people travel for work and that types of thing, for small trips, that's perfectly fine. But anytime they're separated in that year that they are using for immigration, any of those separations have to have been obviously temporary and of course short. Now in analyzing the difference between sponsoring somebody who already is in Canada and somebody who's outside Canada, we need to take a look at a few of these elements here. So regulation 124 gives us some really great insight into those differences between someone who's in Canada and someone who's outside Canada. Now, if a person is sponsoring a spouse or common law partner who is in Canada, then they have to live together in Canada, of course. Uh, you'll notice that conjugal partner is not on this. And I'll, in the next, uh, when we talk about conjugal partners, you'll see why it's impossible for a conjugal partner to be in Canada already. All right, so they have to live together, of course, in Canada. That person has to have temporary resident status in Canada. Now, this is something we're going to take a look at in detail later on, but it can't be someone who doesn't have a visa, who doesn't have a permit, and is in Canada illegally, because then they would be inadmissible, of course.
and pretty obviously they have to be sponsored. All right, there are some other elements that we need to take a look at as well. Now, when we take a look at Regulation 124B, that the person has to have temporary resident status in Canada, there is a little tiny detail that we can take a look at over here as well. So the person can't be subject of an enforcement proceeding. So if the person has a removal order, even if they're going to get married or they're living common law with someone, they would not be eligible for this, unless it's a humanitarian compassionate reasons or something like that. But in general, the person would not be eligible to be sponsored as a spouse or common law partner in Canada. However, if there is a lack of status, then the officer has the option of not enforcing that, of not seeing the lack of status as making the future spouse or common law partner or current spouse or current common law partner, of course, inadmissible. Okay, so as we can see over here, in terms of being inadmissible due to lack of status, it can be waived. So there's a spouse of public policy that allows this to be waived. So that is the one little exception to Regulation 124B. Of course, just like anybody else, the person has to have a valid passport or travel document in order to obtain permanent residence, permanent residence status or any status in Canada, really. Uh, refugees, of course, there's a little exception over there, but we'll talk about that in the refugees lesson later on. Now, something really important as well, and this is something when you have clients, you're going to have to really tell them and really make sure that they don't do this, is that if they take a little holiday, if they go out of the country or go home and then they think they'll come back, if they leave Canada, they've abandoned their application. So there's no guarantee that the person will actually be allowed to return to Canada because if the person's on a, let's say a tourist visa or maybe a study permit or something like that, if it's single entry, there's no guarantee that they'll be allowed to come back into Canada. So that is something to really be aware of as well with spouses, common law partners in Canada being sponsored for permanent residency. And of course, this plays a role in a lot of other programs, right? So if a person has a temporary status in Canada that is only single entry and they want to maybe go to the States or go home or something like that and come back to Canada, remember there's no guarantee that they'll be let back in. And in terms of their PR sponsorship, if they're sponsoring, if they're applying in Canada, then in many, many, many cases, they'll be deemed that they've abandoned that sponsorship. So something, one of those big common themes that you should really be aware of in terms of immigration procedures and how it can play a role in your exam. So in looking at the proof people need to have in order to sponsor a common law partner, you'll see that they need Quite a bit. So like we talked about before, it's a marriage-like relationship. Now in a marriage, you would assume that people have shared bank accounts, shared credit cards, shared ownership, everything like that. Uh, of course, a lot of marriages don't, but in terms of preparing a, a strong sponsorship case for marriage and for common law partners as well, uh, what an RCIC or a future RCIC like you would do is of course really make sure that they've got everything shared and that you can prove everything's shared. It's not enough to just say that uh, one partner has been living with another partner because that would be almost like being roommates really. So you can see that even though the couple needs to have lived together for a minimum of 12 months, it actually goes a lot deeper than that. So the relationship has to be ongoing, marriage-like, of course not for immigration purposes only and that kind of thing as well that we'll take a look at later on, 
But you could see when you have to prove all of these elements that are shared, that is where you can see how deep the relationship must be. All right, so shared leases, rental receipts, shared bills, shared household expenses and that kind of thing, and even the mail that they get. They have to prove that they receive mail at the same address. Uh, when you take a look at one of the cases below, so at the bottom of this page, if you're looking on the Full Skills Exam Prep website, you have a really great case over there that explains this in detail, and which answers the question basically, if a couple can prove that they are spouses or in a common law relationship, if they choose to not live together. Okay, the, the answer is no, of course, but it's a, it's a really interesting case. It helps you to really see what I'm talking about here in detail and in the context of an element that might be on your full skills exam. All right, let's touch upon conjugal partners now. Now, this is a really interesting piece of the puzzle for you in terms of understanding spousal sponsorships, common law relationships, and conjugal partners, and of course the differences between each of those. So essentially a conjugal partner is somebody or a couple who's in a relationship. So the relationship timelines are the same as a common law partner where that relationship has to be for at least one year. But the other piece of this is that the couple couldn't live together or they couldn't get married for a few reasons. So one of those reasons might be because of an immigration barrier. So maybe one partner lives in one country, the other partner lives in another country, and maybe they're both rejected for visas. So maybe for an immigration barrier, that's the reason that the couple can't live together. All right, you have some other elements here. Now in some countries, for example, divorce is illegal. So maybe one partner is married to someone or married somebody when they were younger and they're technically divorced, but they can't get an official divorce because it's illegal in another country. Okay, and here is a pretty common one. We're going to see this in one of the questions later on. Now, in a lot of countries, same-sex marriage is illegal. And in some other countries, same-sex relationships, of course, are illegal as well. So maybe the couple couldn't live together or get married because of these barriers. Now, when we're looking at proof with conjugal partners, we have to really be able to prove that there's a reason why they couldn't live together. So like we talked about before, maybe they were refused visas to go visit each other in each other's countries. So that would have to be both partners, of course, because if one person was rejected, one person was accepted, then the person who was accepted could go visit the person who was rejected and spend time over there, of course. Okay, maybe they're in a relationship, maybe a, a same-sex couple, for example. Maybe they're in a relationship where if they're caught they'll get a huge prison sentence or something like that. So, of course, that would be a reason why they couldn't be together. And, of course, maybe a war happened or kept them apart, maybe a natural disaster or something like that. Anyways, all of these would have to be proven in order to sponsor somebody as a conjugal partner. So let's take a look now at some common situations that do not make a person eligible for sponsorship as a conjugal partner. One of those, of course, is that the couple could have lived together, but they just chose not to. Now that, of course, is not a conjugal 
relationship because if you remember, these are, in order to sponsor somebody as a conjugal partner, those are really extreme conditions that the RCIC or that the couple would have to prove in order to be able to sponsor that person as a conjugal partner and not a common law or a spouse. So if a couple wants to live together, maybe one person in that couple had a great job or they're in school and they, or maybe they just weren't ready to live together, then they're choosing to not have this common law relationship or be married. So that does not qualify as a conjugal partner. Okay, if even if the couple has some really out of, out of their control reasons why they could not live together, remember they have to prove this. So even if they had some of those, uh, those examples we saw earlier where maybe it's illegal for them to live together or have a relationship, if they can't prove that, then they wouldn't be able to be sponsored as conjugal partners. Okay, and if the couple, maybe they live apart or maybe uh, they, maybe one of them's in school in a certain country and the other person is working in another country, any of those elements, if the couple is engaged to be married, then they do not qualify as conjugal partners. Instead, what would happen is that the couple would get married and then applies a spouse or if they can finally move in together in a marriage-like relationship, as we saw before, then they would have to live together for 12 months. Remember all the proof that we saw before as well. And remember that's a long-term marriage-like relationship. They would instead do that and apply later as spouses or common law partners. Okay, so in conclusion with conjugal partners, it's a very, very, very extreme circumstance when someone can sponsor someone else as a conjugal partner. So now that we've seen those three main relationships in terms of sponsoring somebody as either a spouse or a common law partner or a conjugal partner, and hopefully you're getting a feel for the difference between those relationships as well. Let's take a step back and take a look at the sponsor himself or herself to see those general requirements as well. So just like all the other programs really in the family class, the sponsor as a very, very, very first start must be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. Now this person of course has to be at least 18 years of age, reside in Canada. And of course, they have to have filed a sponsorship application. So we saw this before in the parent and grandparent lesson. And this is a pretty, this is probably a pretty straightforward concept for you now because we went through uh, that work with the parents and grandparents in this. The difference between Regulation 130 and the requirements of the sponsor in terms of sponsoring a spouse, common law partner, conjugal partner, dependent child is over here in regulation 132. And that is of course a sponsor who doesn't live in Canada. Now the sponsor who doesn't live in Canada, he can certainly sponsor, he or she can certainly sponsor a spouse, common law partner, conjugal partner, uh, or dependent child. We'll talk about dependent children of course in the next lesson. And that is if the sponsor will reside in Canada when the foreign national becomes a permanent resident. So if a couple is living outside Canada in another country and the sponsor is, of course, as a very first step, he's at least 18, has filed a sponsorship application. Remember that they can actually apply still outside Canada. That's not an issue at all. The difference is that the sponsor has to be living in Canada when the spouse, common law partner, conjugal partner becomes Canadian or become, uh, activates their permanent residency. Okay, and you're going to have a question on this exact procedural requirement once you work through the simulation questions later on.
So let's take a look now at restricted relationships. We've seen already that a sponsor who meets the requirements, of course, of being a sponsor, and we just saw a couple little elements of that before. We're going to dig it into that again later on in the lesson. But they can sponsor someone as either a spouse, common law partner, or conjugal partner. Remember, for a spouse, that's essentially a married, well, a marriage. If a person gets married, that person is their spouse. A common law partner is a marriage-like relationship. And finally, a conjugal partner is one of those extreme circumstances where a couple is a part because of some sort of situation outside of their control. Now, there are some commonalities across all of these elements, and those are restricted relationships. So let's jump into this topic over here. So let's make your life a little bit easier here, and let's take a look at some restrictions that are involved in sponsoring somebody as a common law relationship, a spouse, or a conjugal partner, but of course in the context of your ICCRC full skills exam. Now, one of these, of course, deals with the age of the spouse or common law partner, conjugal partner. Remember, there's also an age restriction on the sponsor himself where if he or she is under 18, basically the person can't sponsor somebody. And if the spouse is under 18, they can't be sponsored. All right, so the other ones are over here. Now we have the genuineness of the relationship. So this is just like everything else. Basically, no fraud. Uh, we have a sponsorship bar that we're going to look at in detail because this is a little tricky area that might come up on the exam. We have dealing with the legality of the marriage in Canada and in the foreign country. Now that concept we're going to dig into pretty deeply and one of your sample questions later on is going to deal with exactly that topic. Okay, we have uh, number five, which is a remote marriage ceremony. And finally, number six, which is having a spouse, common law partner, conjugal partner who is not declared. All right, so let's go through these one by one and we'll go through this in detail just to really make sure that you have a great understanding of this. So let's take a look first at that age restriction in sponsoring a spouse, common law partner, or conjugal partner. So essentially, it's really straightforward. If either party is under 18, then they can't be sponsored. It's that simple, really. Let's say the couple gets married at 17, and maybe one partner or the partner overseas is 17 years old, the partner in Canada is maybe 20 years old or 22 or something like that, that's fine except that they would have to wait until that spouse or partner overseas is 18. All right, so number two deals with the genuineness of the relationship. This one, personally, I think it's pretty common sense. If there is any type of scenario in your exam that involves a couple getting married for primarily for immigration purposes or as part of a scam or something like that, of course that person can't be sponsored. That's a fake marriage, essentially. So let's talk about the sponsorship bar here. Now this can be pretty tricky on your exam and it's really, really, really a great topic to understand because well, by understanding this really, if it ever comes up on your exam, you'll be able to hit home run with it. So we're gonna look at this through the context of a scenario and a story of a couple here. So we have John and Sylvia who we're gonna start with. All right, so you can see they're a couple. Now John is Canadian, he's a Canadian citizen 
and let's say he sponsors Sylvia as either a spouse or a common law partner, a conjugal partner. Now Sylvia becomes a permanent resident, which means essentially that she's now Canadian. However, unfortunately, the couple breaks up. Now John has a new relationship and Sylvia as well. So John, of course, is still Canadian because he's a Canadian citizen and his new partner is Colombian. Let's say that Ben and Sylvia have a relationship as well. But when we're looking at John, in terms of understanding whether or not the sponsorship bar is three years or five years, John originally sponsored Sylvia. So for the sponsor himself or herself, he can't sponsor another spouse or common law partner or conjugal partner for three years. This of course is the same thing. Let's say he sponsored Sylvia as a spouse and now he wants to sponsor Lorena as a common law partner. He still has to wait those three years. Now with Sylvia, it's a little bit different. So Sylvia at this point is Canadian. Oh, maybe she has double, dual citizenship with, with Spain as well, but her new partner is British. Now her sponsorship bar is five years long because she was sponsored. All right, so the difference between the two is that the person, or the Canadian or permanent resident who is sponsoring someone else, in this case, John sponsored Sylvia, so he has to wait three years in order to sponsor someone else. Sylvia was sponsored, so she has to wait five years to sponsor someone else. All right, I hope that clears that up for you a little bit. Uh, a lot of people ask about this in the seminar. And with this, I don't know, this diagram and this uh, story, I think it makes it a little bit easier for you to understand. So if anything like this comes up in the exam, again, you're going to be covered. I've got a simulation question for you later on dealing with this as well, just to make sure that uh, your life is a little bit easier in the exam. Okay, an important element, of course, to look at is the legality of that marriage. Now, the marriage has to be legal, of course, in both Canada and in the other country. So let's say in the other country, maybe they don't recognize same-sex marriage. Or maybe people from different religions can't get married. Maybe... Uh, somebody from a different tribe or something like that can't marry someone else. Okay, so with this one here, this can be a tricky little area in the exam as well. I've got this in a simulation question for you later on, of course, just, to, just so you can really see this in the context of a scenario that might be on your exam. Just remember that, let's say a, a gay couple, for example, if gay marriage is illegal, in the country where they're living, obviously gay marriage in Canada is legal, but that wouldn't make the couple necessarily ineligible for immigration, or the partner, I mean, would not be ineligible to be sponsored. Instead, that partner could be sponsored as a common law partner or a conjugal partner as well. As you saw before, if you remember, we talked about um, same-sex couples, for example, maybe it's illegal for them to live together or have an official relationship in certain countries. So maybe the partner instead, obviously they wouldn't be able to get married, so maybe the partner instead would be sponsored as a conjugal partner. Of course, the solution for those complications would be for the couple to get married here in Canada because then they would have that Canadian marriage certificate which would assuming everything else is okay, make the partner eligible to be sponsored as a spouse. And just a tiny little element here to touch upon 
because it's included in all the regulations and the manuals you're going to look at as well. So on the contrary, a marriage that is legal in another country, but is not legal here, would of course be ineligible for sponsorship in terms of immigration. This would include definitely bigamous, polygamous relationships as well, where someone's marrying a few other people. Uh, that's illegal in Canada, so obviously the person would not be able to sponsor one of those partners or those partners. And another element of this to look at is whether or not the marriage is legal and recognized in both countries. So that means in Canada and of course in the other country. Now there's a few little elements in here that we'll take a look at because again these can be tricky and they might play a role in your exam. So when we take a look at regulation 117 which you should be becoming an expert on. And we jump ahead to uh, 117.9c. We can see that they discuss restricted relationships. This one is specifically about spouses. So with regard to spouses, a person or a spousal relationship would not be considered valid for immigration purposes if they are married, but at the time of the marriage, the sponsor was married to somebody else. So if we go back to that example that we saw earlier with John and Sylvia, now let's pretend that the couple broke up just like we saw before. But the tricky part comes here. So maybe they broke up, but if they did not get formally divorced, then in the next part over here, when John and Lorena get married, so John of course is Canadian, Lorena is Colombian, and let's say John wants to sponsor her later on. Now in this little example here, we'll just pretend that they got married seven years after John and Sylvia broke up. So you know that John's sponsorship restriction has passed by quite a few years, so that doesn't play a role really in this. But what we are looking at is the fact that this would certainly be ineligible for immigration because essentially John is still married. So John is still married to Sylvia, which makes his marriage to Lorena not valid for immigration purposes. Now, as we go a little bit deeper into those restricted relationships, we can see that as we go a little bit deeper into regulation 179 C2A and B, we could see that there is an element, of course, of the couple living together. Now, if the spouse and his or her partner have lived separate for at least a year, that in itself might not be an issue. They still have to prove, of course, the authenticity of the relationship. But the relationship would, of course, be ineligible if one of those people, so either the sponsor or the foreign national being sponsored, are now the common law partner of another person. Or, of course, if they have a conjugal partner. All right, let's take a look at an example of this through the same characters we were looking at before. So we have Ben and Sylvia here. And Ben and Sylvia got married, but just after the marriage, let's pretend that Ben has to go back to England to work for a year. All right, now while in England, 
And a year later, he's dating someone and says, hey, we should move in together, which would be the beginning, of course, of a common law relationship. Now, that would make this relationship between Ben and Sylvia inadmissible to be sponsored. Now, one other element has to do with what I call remote marriages. That would be marriages done through the internet or by phone where the two people aren't physically together. Now, about a year ago, this used to be accepted, but now it's not. Okay, so the IRCC doesn't recognize marriages conducted by telephone, internet. Uh, they say fax. I don't know how somebody would use fax with this, but it's there. And uh, by proxy as well. So proxy means that a person can represent another person to basically stand in for him during the wedding. Now for the IRCC, just like I said before, they don't accept these types of marriage as being valid for immigration purposes. However, there is an exception. Now that exception is for Canadian soldiers. So people who are in the armed forces and if they are stationed overseas or working somewhere where they are forced to, I guess, marry their partner through the internet, then that would be the only exception to this. I think this is a pretty rare example, but uh, it's in your test date data book, of course, in case it in case it pops up in your exam. Now, the final element that we'll look at in terms of restricted spouse, common law, conjugal partner relationships deals with the person not being declared. This is a really, really, really great little tidbit to understand because it relates to family class as a whole. Basically, when somebody immigrates, if they don't declare a family member as being either accompanying or non-accompanying, then that person cannot be sponsored later on. Now this goes for everything. This goes for parents, grandparents, this goes for dependent children, uh, etc. So it's really, of course, important for the sponsor when he's doing his original immigration application to include everybody, whether or not those people are accompanying. Uh, I've got a little person for you over here. And essentially, this is what this person is saying. You're going to see this in the court cases below. There's a couple court cases that deal with exactly this, where a person would file for leave for judicial review because essentially their sponsorship was rejected because they didn't include that person on the application. All right, so this person over here says, yeah, he's really happy and excited. He's filling out his application for permanent residency. And maybe he has a little bit of confusion. He says, well, I'm coming by myself. So I'm not going to declare my wife because she's not accompanying me until later. And what's going to happen, of course, is later on when he's attempting to sponsor his wife, he's going to be a little bit stressed out and in, well, I would assume in some pretty big trouble with his wife as well, because he won't be able to sponsor her. She wasn't declared on his application. So later on, he won't be able to sponsor her. Okay, so it's been almost an hour already in this lesson and well time flies for me really when we do this because I really like doing these and uh, I like helping you pass the full skills exam. So let's do a little tiny review of what we talked about already. So remember of course that the person being sponsored has to be 18 or older by the time the application is received by the IRCC. Okay, that's uh, an update from just last, or I guess just about a year ago now. Just like everything else, uh, this should be pretty straightforward, really. The relationship has to be genuine. It can't be a couple getting married just for immigration status. Uh, it has to be a real relationship 
all the time really. And this of course is when you're looking at uh, adoptions, all that, pretty much everything really in immigration has to be genuine. All right, uh, obviously the couple can't have been married to someone else during their current marriage or in a common law relationship with someone else while they're declaring um, themselves as a spouse or a common law partner or conjugal partner of someone else. Okay, if the couple lived apart, they can't have been the common law partner of another person, of course, during that time. Okay, as we just saw, all the family members have to be declared on the person's original immigration package as either being accompanying or non-accompanying. If the person surprises the IRCC later on by saying, actually, I was married the whole time, or no, I've had this, my, I've had my parents uh, the whole time I've been here. I just didn't include them on the application. The person won't be able to sponsor them. Okay, remember there's the sponsored restriction timeline. Now, if you remember from before, that's either three years or five years, depending on who sponsored who. And of course, there are the regular admissibility factors that have to be met. Now, this includes quite a few elements. Uh, we're going to look at this in, a, in another lesson in detail, but essentially criminality, medical inadmissibility, uh, the person can't be a war criminal or anything like that, of course. All right, so let's take a step back and look at some general notes with regard to sponsoring here. Just like we talked about before, the applicant has to include everybody on the application. Now this is for everything in immigration. Every single person immigrating, if they're in Canada, if they're abroad, if they're going under maybe an economic program or something else, they have to include their relatives. And that is of course accompanying and non-accompanying. Uh, in, in case someone was married to someone else or in a common law relationship or conjugal relationship with someone else, they have to include that as well. So if they're divorced or separated, they have to include that partner on the application as well. And not only that, but they have to prove that they've been separated from that person for at least a year. So if someone ended their marriage six months ago, and then now they're being sponsored by someone else, then uh, as a spouse or common law partner or a conjugal partner, then that application would not be accepted because the person being sponsored cannot prove that they've been separated for a year from their previous partner. Okay, a little tidbit over here with regard to inadmissibility is that just like we saw before, Spouses and common law partners and conjugal partners, they can't be inadmissible due to excessive demand. So if they have an illness or something like that, that's going to cost the taxpayers more than the number right now is, I believe, $6,600 a year. But then that, that, would, that alone would not make them inadmissible to Canada. And LICO. So LICO can be a tricky little piece of the puzzle for you as well. Now, the LICO for the sponsor does not have to be met. But if you remember from Article 39, the sponsor still has to meet financial requirements uh, in terms of arrangements that he made for supporting these people coming to Canada. So if the person can't prove that he has he or she has not made any arrangements other than social assistance, then even though the person doesn't have to meet the LICO, the sponsorship would be rejected under Article 39. Now, just a reminder on an undertaking. So just like all the other 
family class programs, there is an undertaking for spouses, common law partners, and conjugal partners as well. Oh, that undertaking, as we saw before in a couple of the other lessons, they have to basically, the sponsor has to prove that he's going to take care of the person who's coming to Canada and their dependent family as well. So this helps to ensure that the family does not receive social assistance. And as we saw before, the sponsor would have his undertaking with the Canadian government if they're going to Canada. If they're going to Quebec, then the sponsor would have his undertaking with the Midi. Of course, with Quebec sponsorship, we're going to have another really thorough lesson on Quebec uh, later on that you can tune into. But in the context of federal sponsorship, the person's undertaking would be with the Canadian government. And as we saw before with parents and grandparents, remember that meeting those basic requirements means food, clothing, daily life sort of things. So the undertaking in terms of the requirements and what the sponsor has to do is pretty much the same as we saw before. The difference is in the length of the undertaking. So if you remember, we saw with parents and grandparents, we saw with lonely family members, adopted children, orphan children, etc., that the length of undertaking was a little bit different for each of these. Well, for spouses and common law partners and conjugal partners, it's only three years. But just like all the other programs that we saw, this undertaking begins when the person arrives in Canada, because essentially that's when their permanent residency begins. All right, and as we saw before, this undertaking is incredibly serious. The undertaking lasts as long as the time lasts. It doesn't matter if the sponsor has some difficulty, if he loses his job, gets divorced, uh, the relationship breaks down, etc. It All those elements do not cancel the undertaking. So we talked about the different types of relationships that people have that can be sponsored as either a spouse or a common law partner or a conjugal partner. And I think now you have a really clear idea on the differences between each of those. We talked about some of the commonalities between them, especially in terms of restricted relationships. And we talked about the person being sponsored and of course, their inadmissibility requirements. Uh, let's take a look again at the sponsor himself or herself and we could see some of the restrictions placed on this person as to whether or not he or she can sponsor someone. So this is the same that we saw with a lot of the other elements in family class. So remember that someone can't sponsor a family member, even a spouse, if they are still in agreement and have failed to provide that financial support to somebody else that they sponsored as a family member. Okay, if they owe money on alimony, child support, maybe they've been receiving government assistance. Now, of course, a disability doesn't count in this. Maybe they have an immigration loan that they've missed some payments on or they haven't paid and declaring bankruptcy. Just as we saw before as well, remember that if a person has one of these restrictions, what they can do is simply pay that money back and then they would be eligible. Now we have uh, those violent bars as well. So remember if a person committed any type of violent crime, sexual crime against pretty much any family member, past, present, no matter how far removed, then they would be ineligible to be a sponsor as well, unless they apply for, for rehabilitation and that kind of thing. Okay, if the person is subject of a removal order or the person's in prison, etc., same thing, they can't sponsor 
a spouse. Uh, the difference, of course, here is that the lyco doesn't have to be met as we saw before. So just to reiterate on this, remember that the lyco is not needed for these people being, well, for the sponsor, except if the spouse being sponsored has dependent children who have dependent children of their own. So that's a really rare example that happens, because especially when you look at dependent children. So that would mean maybe, for example, a let's say somebody is a Canadian is sponsoring a spouse like John and Lorena from Colombia. So let's say that Lorena maybe has a 17 year old son and that 17 year old son has a two year old son. Then they would have to meet the LICO. John would have to meet the LICO in that case. Now that's an incredibly rare example. More generally, when you're looking at the exam itself and you're looking at LICO, you'd have to take a look at the sponsor and maybe he's just sponsoring a, a, a spouse. So in that case, he wouldn't have to meet the LICO, but remember that if the person's unable or unwilling to support themselves or their dependent children, and maybe they don't have any arrangements for their care support other than government assistance, then the person wouldn't be admissible to be a sponsor anyways under Article 39. Okay, so let's talk about the process here a little bit because, again, this is one of those topics that goes across the spectrum for you in terms of family sponsorship. Okay, so let's take a look at spouses here. Now, if you have the sponsor over here and he puts together an application, submits that application to first be a sponsor and also the permanent resident application at the same time. Now, this one here would go to the CPC in Mississauga. And then it depends on whether or not it's accepted or rejected. So if it is rejected and the sponsor is proven to not meet those requirements of being a sponsor, the sponsor would obviously be informed. Now what he can do then, and what he should do then, of course, is withdraw the application. And he should fix whatever the problem was before applying again. However, he has a second option, and that is to not withdraw the application. Now, in all the manuals, in everything like that, as well and in experience really in working with these types of cases, his application won't be accepted. So it'll be rejected anyways but it's certainly his right. Uh, and once that application is rejected, he can appeal that if he wishes to. Now, going back to the start, so if he submits that application to sponsor somebody and also submits the application for PR at the same time to CPC Mississauga, and he meets those requirements to sponsor, then that's some pretty good news and they would inform him of the approval. This depends, this makes a little bit of a difference if the person's in Canada or out of Canada, uh, who would be informed. Now then the spouse, common law partner, conjugal partner goes for security checks, background checks, and that type of thing. Uh, in the manuals, you'll see that they say they should then go for the medical checks, but in reality, what you do is submit the, do the medical before, of course, because it saves time. 
And then finally, if all of that is accepted, the spouse, common law partner, or conjugal partner will have an interview. And then, if all goes well, they would get approval right there. Now, just to dig into the procedures a little bit more, we're going to look at suspension of sponsorship. So this is when a process is suspended, not cancelled. So a process is suspended if the sponsor himself gets into trouble. All right, so if he commits an offense, charged with an offense, and the term of imprisonment is at least 10 years. So those are serious crimes, of course. Okay, so the sponsor as well, if he's subject to a report that would make him or her inadmissible to Canada, then it would be suspended. Okay, if uh, maybe he or she lied on a PR application originally, and then they became a citizen and they're getting their citizenship revoked now, then again, that sponsorship of the spouse, common law partner, conjugal partner would be suspended as well. Okay, and of course, if the sponsor is found out to be inadmissible in terms of security, human rights organ uh, violations, criminality, then again, that suspension of sponsorship would occur. So this is why right at the beginning, it's absolutely a million percent essential for you as RCICs to really do everything perfectly because you'll see later on in a person's life and, and you'll see in some of the cases that you're going to read later on too. Some people just don't mention something in their application. Then when they, years later, when they want to sponsor someone, the agents would look through or the officers would look through this person's background and maybe uncover something that the person didn't declare in their original PR application that would suspend the sponsorship, of course, and maybe even make the sponsor inadmissible to Canada himself. So then the removal orders would begin. Okay, and if the sponsor, as we saw before with the process, if the sponsor is appealing the loss of his or her permanent resident status, and then of course they can't sponsor someone else. Now, in terms of canceling the sponsorship or canceling the undertaking, it certainly is possible, but it has to be done before the visa office issues those permanent resident visas. It's all done online as well through the online form. Now, if this happens after the visa office has issued those permanent resident visas, then the undertaking is still there, of course. So that's why people have to take this obviously really seriously because if the visa office issues those visas and then maybe the relationship breaks down or the couple gets divorced or something like that, the sponsor still has to, still has to meet his or her undertaking. Now, another element that plays a role in all immigration streams, really, is when someone's life changes. So anytime someone has maybe another a birth in the family, or maybe someone passed away, or maybe somebody got married to somebody, divorced from someone, anything like that, they always have to update the CIC. Because remembering if they fail to do so, later on, when the person wants to sponsor that other person, the person probably wasn't declared. So he or she would not be admissible. All right, and same thing over here, changes of address. So if pretty much anybody moves, they have to inform the CIC as well. So if they move to a different province, maybe to Quebec or from Quebec to another province, province to a province, same thing, 
basically they have to inform the CIC of any changes. Now the final element that we'll look at in this lesson deals with spouses and common law partners in Canada who are either studying or working. Now a lot of you probably look like the person on the left here, you're probably studying right now. Soon you'll be the person on the right here, you'll be an RCIC and you're going to love your job. Alright so for those spouses and common law partners remember that they have to maintain status in Canada. There is of course the exception in terms of when they apply for permanent resident status as spouses or common law partners. So remember there is that little exception uh, that lack of status would not necessarily make them inadmissible. However, remember that a person needs to have a work permit or study permit in order to work or study. So if that person has a work or study permit at the moment, that's not a problem. They could keep working, studying, as long as that permit stays valid. But the the spouse or common law partner in Canada, if they're here, let's say on a tourist visa, or maybe they don't even have status, they can't work or study unless they have a work permit or study permit. So they would have to apply for a work permit or study permit. All right, so that concludes this lesson here. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you about spouses and common law partners and conjugal partners. Remember, this plays a pretty big role on your exam, so it's really great we got you this one big step closer to passing the full skills exam. Now, I hope you have a better understanding of, of course, spouses and common law partners and conjugal partners, but remember, we looked at a lot of those elements that play a role in a lot of the immigration programs, especially family immigration programs. So I hope that brought you, again, a step closer to understanding some of the other topics we talked about a little bit deeper and the next steps for you of course are to go through the upcoming simulation questions so that's going to help you take all this knowledge and put it in the context of questions you might face on the full skills exam all right so a very big thank you again have a beautiful day and as always keep working you're almost there if you're taking the full skills exam soon you're eh, one step closer and when we help you pass the full skills exam, then you'll be an RCIC. All right, so I can't wait for you to become an RCIC. Stay tuned for those sample questions.